Chapter 58. Tyranny with a Difference. There was at least one quality of the new conquerors of San Lorenzo that was really new, wrote Young Castle. McCabe and Johnson dreamed of making San Lorenzo a utopia. To this end, McCabe overhauled the economy and the laws. Johnson designed a new religion. Castle quoted the Calypsos again. I wanted all things to seem to make some sense. So we could be happy, yes, instead of tense. And I made up lies so that they fit, that they all fit nice, and I made this sad world a paradise. There was a tug in my coat sleeve as I read. I looked up. Little Newton Honecker was standing on the aisle next to me. I thought maybe you'd like to go back to the bar, he said, and hoist a few. So we did hoist a few, hoist and topple a few, and Newt's tongue was loosened enough to tell me some things about Zinka, his Russian midget dancer friend. The love nest, he told me, had been in his father's cottage on Cape Cod. I may never, ha- I may not ever have a marriage, but at least I've had a honeymoon. He told me of the idyllic hours he and Zinka had spent in each other's arms, cradled in Phoenix Honecker's old white wicker chair, the chair that faced the sea. And Zinka would dance for him, imagine woman chancing just for me. I could see you have no regrets. She broke my heart. Uh, I didn't like that very much. But that was the price. In this world, you get what you pay for. He proposed a gallant toast. Sweethearts and wives, he cried. Chapter 59. Fasten your seatbelts. I was in the bar with Newt and H. Lowell Crosby and a couple of strangers when San Lorenzo was sighted. Crosby was talking about pissants. You know what I mean by pissant? I know the term, I said, but obviously I don't have the ding-a-ling association for me that it has for you. Crosby was in his cups and had a drunkard's illusion that he could speak frankly, provided he spoke, provided he spoke affectionately. He spoke frankly and affectionately of Newt's size, somebody, something nobody else in the bar had so far commented on. I don't mean a little, f- I don't mean a little fellow like this. Crosby hung a ham hand on Newt's shoulder. It isn't his side that makes a man a pissant. It's the way he thinks. I've seen men four times as big as his little fella here, and they were pissant. And I've seen little fellows, well, not this little, actually, but pretty damn little, by God. And I call them real men. Thanks, said Newt pleasantly, not even glancing at the monstrous hand in his shoulder. Never I'd seen a human being better adjusted to such a humiliating physical handicap. I shuddered with admiration. You were talking about pissants, I said to Crosby, hoping to get the weight of, of his hand off Newt. Damn right I was, Crosby straightened up. You haven't told us what a pissant is yet, I said. A pissant is somebody who thinks he's so damn smart, he can never keep his mouth shut, no matter what anybody says. He's got to argue with it. You say something, you say you like something, like, and by God, he'll tell you why you're wrong to like it. A pissant does his best to make you feel like a boob all the time, no matter what you say. He knows better. Not a very attractive characteristic, I suggested. My daughter wanted to marry a pissant once, said Crosby darkly. Did she? I squashed him like a bug, Crosby hammered on the bar. Remember the things the pissant had done. Jesus, he said. We've all been to college. His gaze lit on Newt again. You go to college? Cornell, said Newt. Cornell, cried Crosby gladly. My God, I went to Cornell. So did he, Newt nodded at me. Three Cornellians, all in the same place, said Crosby, and we had another grand falloon festival on our hands. When it subsided some, Crosby asked Newt what he did. I'd paint. Houses? Pictures. I'll be damned, said Crosby. Return to your seats and fasten your seatbelts, please, warned the airline hostess. We're over Monsignor Airport, Boulevard San Lorenzo. Christ, now what made it just, now just wait a goddamn minute here, said Crosby, looking at Newt. All of a sudden, I realize you got a name I've heard before. My father was, my father was the father of the atomic atom bomb. Newt didn't say Felix Honecker was one of the fathers. He said Felix was the father. Is that so, said Crosby. That's so. I was thinking about something else, said Crosby. He had to think hard. Something about a dancer. I think we'd better get back to our seat, said Crosby. He said Newt, tightening some. Something about a Russian dancer. Crosby was sufficiently addled by booze to see no harm in thinking out loud. I remember an editorial about how maybe a dancer was a spy. Please, gentlemen, said the stewardess, you must really get back to your seats and fasten your seatbelts. Newt looked up at H. Crow, H. Low Crosby innocently. You sure the name was Honecker? 
and in order to eliminate any chance of a mistaken identity, he spilled the name for Crosby. I could be wrong, said H. Low Crosby. Chapter 60. An Unprivileged Nation. An Underprivileged Nation. The island, seen from the air, was an amazingly rec regular rectangle. A cool and, use cool and useless stone needles were thrust up from the sea. They sketched a circle around it. At the south end of the island was the port city of Bolivar. It was the only city. It was the capital. It was built on a marshy table. The runways of Monsanto Airport were on its waterfront. The mountains rose abu abruptly from the n to the north of Bolivar, crowning the remainder of the island with their brutal humps. They were called the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, but they looked like pigs at, at a trail to meet. Bolivar had many names. Casma Casma, Santa Maria, St. Louis, St. George, and Port Glory, among them. It was given its present name by Johnson and McCabe in 1922. It was named in honor of Sim Simone Simon Bolivar, the great Latin American idolist and hero. I'll say Simon, or I'll say Simon. When Johnson and McCabe came upon the city, <coughs> it was built of twigs, tin, crates, and mud. Rested on the catacombs of a truly happy scavengers, catacombs in a sour marsh of slop, feculence, and slime. That was pretty much the way I found it too, except for new architectural false face among along the waterfront. Johnson and McCabe had failed to raise people from misery and muck. Papa Monzano had failed too. Everybody was bound to fail, for San Lorenzo was an unproductive, as an equal area in, in the Sahara or the polar ice cap. At the same time, it had a dense population as could be found anywhere, India and China not excluded. There were 450 inhabitants for each uninhabitable square mile. During the idealistic phase of McCabe's and Johnson's reorganization of San Lorenzo, it was announced that the country's total income would be divided among all adult persons in equal shares, wrote Philip Castle. The first and only time this was tried, each share came to six and s between six and seven dollars. <coughs> Chapter 61. What a corporal was worth. In the custom shed at Mazzano Airport, we were all required to submit to a luggage inspection and to convert what money we intended to spend in San Lorenzo to, into the local currency, into corporals, which Papa Manzano insisted were worth 50 American cents. The shed was neat and new, but plenty of signs had already been slapped on the walls, higgledy pickledy. Anybody caught practicing Boconoism in San Lorenzo, said one, will die on the hook. Another poster featured a picture of Bocono, a scrawny old colored man who was smoking a cigar. He looked clever and kind and amused. Under the picture were the words, Wanted dead or alive, 10,000 corporals reward. I took a closer look at that poster and found reproduced at the bottom of it some sort of police identification form Bocono had to fill out way back in 1929. It was reproduced, apparently, to show Bocanon hunters what his fingerprints and handwriting were like. But what might interest me were some of the words Bocanon had chosen to put in the blanks in 1929. Wherever possible, he had taken the, cos he had taken the cosmic view, had taken into consideration, for instance, such things as the shortness of life and the longness of eternity. He reported his avocation as being alive. He reported his principal occupation as being dead. This is a Christian nation. All foot will play all all foot play will be punished by the hook, sent out of the sign. The sign was meaningless to me, since I had not yet learned that Bokanonis mingled their souls by pressing the bottoms of their feet together. Hmm. And the greatest mystery of all, since I had not read all of Philip Castle's book, was how Bokanon, bosom bosom friend of Corporal McCabe, had come to be an outlaw. Chapter 62. Why Hazel Wasn't Scared There were seven of us who got off of San Lorenzo, Newt and Angela, Ambassador Minton and his wife, H. Low Crosby and his wife, and I. When we had cleared customs, we were herded outdoors and into a rearing stance. There we faced a very quiet crowd. Five thousand five thousand or more San Lorenzans stared at us. The islanders, islanders were oatmeal colored. The people were thin. There wasn't a fat person to be seen. Every person had teeth missing. Many legs were bowed or swollen. Not one pair of eyes was clear. The women's breasts were bare and paltry. 
the men wore loose loincloths that did not little to to conceal pen pens like wait the men wore loose loincloths that did little to conceal pens just like am i stupid is that say penises or pens i'm saying pens like pendulums on grandfather clocks there were many dogs but not one barked there were many infants but not one cried here there someone coughed and that was all a military band stood at attention before the crowd. It did not play. There was a color guard before the band. It carried two banners, the Stars and Stripes and the Flag of San Lorenzo. The Flag of San Lorenzo consisted of a Marine Corporal's chevrons on a royal blue field. The banners hung lank in the wind this, of, wind this day. I imagined that somewhere far away I heard the blaming of a sledge on a brazen drum. There was no such sound. My soul was simply resonating the beat of the brassy, clanging heat of the San Lorenzo climb. I'm sure glad it's a Christian country, Hazel Crosby whispered to her husband, or I'd be a little scared. Behind us was a xylophone. There was a glittering sign on the xylophone. The sign was made of garnets and rhinestones. The sign said, Mona. Chapter, chapter 63, Reverent and Free to the left side of our reviewing stand were six propeller-driven fighter planes in a row, military assistance from the United States to San Lorenzo. On the fuel usage of each plane was painted, with childish bloodlust, a boa constrictor which was crushing a devil to death. Blood came from the devil's ears, nose, and mouth. A pitchfork was slipping from sat satanic red fingers. Before each plane stood an oatmeal-colored pilot, silent too. Then, above that tumid silence, there came a, nag a nagging song, like the song of a gnat. It was a siren. It was a siren approaching. The siren was on Papa's glossy black Cadillac limousine. The limousine came to a stop before us. Oops. <laughs> Tires smoking. Out climbed Papa Manzano. His adopted daughter, Mona Amon Amons Manzano. Oh, shit. And Franklin Honecker. At a limp, imperious signal from Papa, the crowd sang the San Lorenzo National Anthem. Its melody was Home on the Range. The words had been written in 1922 by Lionel Boyd Johnson, by Bocanone. The, wor these, the words were these. Uh, ours is a land where the living is grand and the men are fearless as sharks. The women are pure and we are always sure that our children will all toe their marks. San San Lorenzo, what a rich, lucky island are we. Our enemies quail, for they know they will fare against people so reverent and free. Chapter 64, Peace and Plenty. And then the crowd was deathly still again. Papa and Mona and Frank joined us on the reviewing stand. One snare drum played as they did so. The drumming stopped when Papa pointed the finger at the drummer. He wore a shoulder holster on the outside of his blouse. The weapon, when it was a chromium-plated forty-five, he was an old, old man, as so many of the members of, men, members of my cross were. He was in poor shape. His steps were small and bounceless. He was still a fat man, but his lard was melting fast, for his simple uniform was lo loose. The balls of his hope-toed eyes were yellow. His hands trembled. His personal bodyguard was Major General Franklin Honecker, whose uniform was white. Franklin, thin-wristed, narrow-shouldered, looked like a child kept up long after his customary bedtime. On his breast was a medal. I observed the two, Papa and Frank, with some difficulty, not because my view was blocked, but because I could not take my eyes off Mona. I was thrilled, heartbroken, hilarious, insane. Every greedy, unreasonable dream I'd ever had about a woman, about what a woman should be, came true in Mona. There. God love her warm and creamy soul, was peace and plenty forever. That girl, when she was only 18, was rapturously and serene. She seemed to understand all, and to be all there was to understand. In the books of Bocanone, she is mentioned by name. One thing Bocanone says of her is this, Mona has the simplicity of the all. Her dress was white and Greek. She wore flat sanders on her small brown feet. Her pale gold hair was lank and long. Her hips were a liar. Oh, God. Peace and plenty forever. She was the one beautiful girl in San Lorenzo. She was the national treasure. 
Papa had adopted her, according to Philip Castle, in order to in order to mingle divinity into the harshness of his rule. The xylophone was rolled into the front of the stand, and Mona played it. She played When Day Is Done. It was all tremolo, swelling, fading, swelling again. The crowd was intoxicated by beauty. And then it was time for Papa to greet us. Chapter 65. A Good Time to Come to San Lorenzo. Papa was a self-educated man who had been a ma- who had been major domo to Corporal McCabe. He had never been off the island. He spoke American English passably well. Everything that one of us said on the interviewing sand was bellowed out at the crowd through doomsday horns. Whatever went out through those horns gaveled down a wide, short boulevard at the back of the crowd, ricocheted off three glass-faced new buildings at the end of the boulevard, and came cackling back. Welcome, said Papa. You were coming to the best friend. Dude, you're coming to the best friend America ever had. America is misunderstood in many places, but not here, Mister Ambassador. He bowed to Mr. he bowed to H. Lo Crosby, the bicycle manufacturer, mistaking him for the new ambassador. I know you've got a good country here, Mister President," said Crosby. "Everything I ever ever heard about it sounds great to me. There's just one thing. Oh, I'm not the ambassador," said Crosby. I wish I was, but I'm just a plain, ordinary businessman. It hurt him to say who the real ambassador was. That, or, that This man over here is the big cheese. Ah, Papa smiled in his mistake. The smile went away suddenly. Some pain inside him made him wince, and then him haunch over, closed his eyes, made him concentrate on surviving the pain. Frank Koniker went to his support, feebly and competently. Are you all right? Excuse me. Papa whispered at last, straightening up, son. There were tears in his eyes. He brushed them away, straightening up all the way. I beg your pardon. He seemed to be in doubt for a moment as to where he was. And as to where he was, as to what was expected of him. And then he remembered. He shook Horlick Mitten's hand. Here you are among friends. I'm sure of it, said Mitten gently. Christian, said Papa. Good. Anti-communist, said Papa. Good. No communists here, said Papa. They fear the hook too much. I should think they would, said Mitten. You picked a very good time to come to us, said Papa. Tomorrow will be one of the happiest days in the history of our country. Tomorrow is our greatest national holiday. The day of the hundred martyrs to democracy. It will also be the day of the engagement of Felix... Oops, sorry, guys. Of the engagement of Felix, Major General Honecker to Mona Amon Manzano the most precious person in my life and in the life of San Lorenzo. I wish you much happiness, Ms. Manzano, and said Mitten warmly, and I congratulate you, General Honecker. The two young people nodded their thanks. Mitten now spoke of the so-called hundred martyrs to democracy as he told a whipping lie. There is not an American schoolchild who does not know the story of San Lorenzo's noble sacrifice in World War II. Uh, the hundred brave San Lorenzo and whose whose day tomorrow is, gave as much freedom-loving men gave as much as a freedom-loving men can. The President of the United States has asked me to be his personal, his personal representative at the ceremonies tomorrow, to cast a wreath, the gift of the American people to the gift of the American people to the people of San Lorenzo on the sea. The people of San Lorenzo thank you and your president and for the generous and the generous people of the United States of America for their thoughtfulness, said Papa. We would be honored if you could cast the reef into the sea during the engagement party tomorrow. The honor is mine. Papa commanded all of us to honor him with our presence at the wreath ceremony engagement party next day. We are to appear at his palace at noon. What children these two will have, said Pop- Papa said, inviting his sister and Frank and Mona. What blood, what beauty. The pain hit him again. He closed his eyes to huddle himself around the pain. He waited for it to pass. But it did not pass. Still in agony, he turned away from us, faced the crowd and the microphone. He tried to gesture at the crowd. He tried to say something to the crowd. Failed. And then the words came out. Go home, he sh- cried, strangling. Go home. The crowd scattered like leaves. Papa faced us again, still grotesque in pain. And then he collapsed.